guys in like forever. <laughs> Feels like with spring break and everything going on. But um, if you guys have your Bibles now, <clears throat> I did not get the U version and time done. I had technical difficulties, so just like. So if you guys uh, would like to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. Thirteen, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> starting in verse 1, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would he have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pray to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed, and respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Uh, before we get in, let's pray um, as we go into the message. God, I just want to thank you for your word and um, being able to have the privilege to come together to discuss it, to read it, and to find out its meaning and intent for our life, Lord. I just ask that whatever I say would be and what you would have me to say, Lord, according to your word, and that people would... Uh, See what you have to say uh, in this passage of Romans 13. And I pray this in your precious son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. <clears throat> Submission to authorities. Yay. Yeah, I get that passage. <laughs> so <clears throat> I thought it'd be interesting to kind of go through um, a couple of laws that are actually in effect nowadays. And it's from the Huffington Post, so I'm guessing it's pretty darn accurate. Um, yeah. Yeah, the real news, right? Is that? No? Okay. <laughs> so, get this. I looked this up. In Florida, if an elephant is left tied to a parking meter, the parking fee has to be paid just as it would for a vehicle. Supposedly, that's real. Wow. In Maine, it is illegal to keep Christmas decorations up after January 14th. I think Rolla could really use that one. <laughs> In Mississippi... One may be fined up to $100 for using profane language in public places. Here you go. You guys will appreciate this one. Tennessee, it is illegal to share your Netflix password. <laughs> so just based on that, how many of you guys have broken that law? Wow. This sermon is for you. <laughs> so <laughs> there's 10 more of laws and stuff, but the whole basic point is that sometimes there's a lot of laws that government have that sometimes we're kind of like, do I really need to follow that? You know, is that really important? So I thought it would be really good to start in. There's three points I'm going to have throughout this, and the first point is authorities are instituted by God. Verses one, just verse one. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. The command is let every person be subject. Why is this? For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. One of the things that we can glean from this part of the verse is that God is sovereign over rulers, governments, and kings. And we see this also prevalent in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 40, uh, verses 23 through 24, "...who brings princes to nothing and makes rulers of the earth as emptiness." Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. Daniel 4.17, the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whom he will, and sets over it the lowliest of men. I'm just going to kind of break the ice, because I know like a couple of you guys have kind of gone through this study a little bit on Sunday and stuff, but the big question that everyone's wondering after reading this passage is what about the evil governing authorities, right? That's kind of your question I'm sure you guys have, especially if you've read this passage before. Well, if the authorities are instituted by God and God is sovereign over different authorities, what about the ones that do bring evil to this world? 
And I don't want to neglect that question, and that's something that I definitely am going to look into for this as we look at um, what exactly it means to be subject to authorities like that. Um, but the first thing is that we understand that if God is ruler over authorities, and I must obey God, then it makes sense for me to obey him by obeying the authorities. I'm going to bring up the cheesy analogy, but I used it last semester, the transitive property, right? You guys all know that one? Yay. <laughs> if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So if God has instituted the authorities, I'm to obey the authorities. That means I'm also, in effect, obeying God. And so that's something really important to recognize. Now, kind of the question is, you know, if God is sovereign, why does he allow evil rulers to be in this world? And that's kind of the question I'm sure you guys are having. Um, but one of the interesting things that uh, me, Ben, and uh, Ben is uh, Nathaniel's uh, cousin. We went up to the, conf- the Gospel Coalition Conference this, uh, the beginning of this week. And one of the things that Ben had brought up, because we talked about this passage, was the fact that Pontius Pilate himself, who was an evil ruler at that time, God used him to bring about, in a way, our salvation. Because Pontius Pilate crucified Jesus Christ. And if it wasn't for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we wouldn't have been saved. Right? He wouldn't have propitiated the wrath of God. So that's something that I think is very interesting. We're going to get more back into that uh, harder question, but that's something to think about. Obviously, the application about this is understanding that God is in control of government and the rulers of the world. Nothing happens that he is not in control of, and he has the ability to take away a ruler or instate a new one. Thus, we must not think that God is incapable of having control over any type of ruler. One of the things that's very popular about nowadays is to worry about governing authorities, to worry about if God is really in control. I mean, this last political campaign was unfortunately a very trying time for a lot of people. A lot of people were extremely worried. And I'm not here to talk about politics, but I'm here to talk about how we react to the things that are going on around us. How do we react to a world that seems so unsure, right? And, and especially when our government, when there's a lot of corruption perhaps in it, how do we react to that? And understanding God's sovereignty is a great comfort one of the alternatives to not believing that God is in control over authorities because there may be evil rulers that come up is the fact that God has no control, which is a much more scarier thought to think about. So it's important to understand that Paul is talking about submitting the authorities because God has instituted them and leads us to point number two. Authorities are instituted by God to terrorize evil. So if we break down the text, verses, uh, I think it's three through five, two through five, therefore... Whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So, because of the command, because of the fact that God is sovereign and has instituted these authorities, therefore, whoever resists these authorities resists what God has appointed, and who those who resist will incur judgment. Why is this? Because rulers are not a terror to good conduct; they're to a terror to bad. They were instituted by God so that we punish wrongdoers, people who are against what God has called us to do in the Ten Commandments, the law. Therefore, we do what is good, and the reward is that we will receive his approval. And why? For he is God's servant for our good. So I want to clarify basically what that word servant means. It doesn't mean that the government is a willful servant, meaning it doesn't mean the government has chosen to be a Christian. It doesn't mean every authority in the government is a Christian. What it means is that he's been used by the sovereignty of God, by God's will, to put him there for a reason. Therefore, if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He has the right to punish. Why? Paul restates it again, for he is the servant of of God. And how is he a servant of God? He's an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So, <clears throat> basically the question that I had, you know, and I always read these texts and there's always questions that I come up with. And the first one is, what is the context of this book since it seems like Paul doesn't realize that government is sometimes a terror to good conduct, right? Like Paul seems to be only stating this, but I think if we look into the historical context, I think we'll get a better picture of why Paul doesn't mention Uh, evil governing authorities in this passage. First point, Paul was treated well as a citizen for the most part. He was a Roman citizen by birth, and this really helped him. The government, I think sometimes we think the Roman government was overtly evil. Now, there was a lot of corruption in the Roman government, but at this time, they also respected the fact of Roman citizenship. If we look at Acts 22, 25 through 29, 
It says, but when they had stretched him out for the whips, they were going to, um, they were going to torture Paul. Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. The tribune answered, I bought the citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, but I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound them. <clears throat> so I think sometimes uh, with a lot of movies or different things, we seem to taint, paint the Roman Empire as completely, utterly evil. And there was definitely things that were absolutely wrong with it, but I think we have to understand that, Rome at, that Paul, as a citizen, was treated fairly well. The second point is that Paul was not naive. A lot of people think that Paul didn't recognize that the Roman government had actually crucified Jesus Christ. Paul understood this. He understood what the Roman government has did, but he's calling people to still submit to them. <clears throat> These last two points really help clarify what Paul is getting at. He says, no, he doesn't say. That's what I say. <laughs> the particular context was that certain Jews in the church were being influenced by zealots Jewish zealots who were inciting political revolution against Rome by not paying their taxes. Some perhaps were influenced not to obey certain laws because of this. One of the major things that people thought Jesus Christ was coming back for was to incite political revolution, a physical revolution against Rome. But we know, like all the disciples believed that, right? Even Peter sliced off a guy's ear because he's like, this is the time that we are going to take over the Roman government when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. But so I think that kind of influenced a lot of people, especially some Jewish Christians and these Jewish zealots like Barabbas, people who would go, they were terrorists. Like if we were to think of them in today's context, they were terrorists who would try to start wars with Rome. They were wanting to see the Jewish people overthrow the Roman government. And so I think Paul is talking to those people who are thinking of a political revolution and are being uh, influenced by these people who don't want them to pay their taxes because that is a affront to the government. The fourth, is that, the fourth is that other influence includes taking the idea of not conforming to the patterns of this world, like we see back in Romans 12, to the extreme by not obeying government authorities. Some probably were also thinking that they were no longer under the law and thus didn't need to follow the law anymore. Paul is addressing this attitude and mentality. So if we go back two sermons ago when we talk about uh, not conforming to the patterns of this world and renewing our minds and how Paul talks about not being under the law of sin and death, some people are taking that and thinking, oh, I don't have to follow the law anymore. I can do whatever I want to do, and it doesn't matter. And Paul is speaking against this. We look at Romans 13.8. I'm kind of skipping a little bit ahead. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. So Paul's like, okay, first off, you are not, you're free from the law of sin and death, meaning you do not need to use the law to obtain righteousness, like we talked about all the way in the past of Romans, but that doesn't mean that you don't follow the law. Because naturally, out of having been saved by grace, it is natural to fulfill the law, right? So you're no longer trying to earn grace, but that should result from grace in you following the law. And so I think that puts it a little bit more in an actual context. <clears throat> the fact that we are free from the law doesn't mean we don't need to follow the law, because following it is the fruit of love, right? If we love our brothers and sisters, that means we're naturally not going to, uh, thou shalt not murder, you know, you shouldn't um, steal from them, right? We fulfill the law when we love our brothers and sisters. Of course, one of the other objections I think comes up is Romans 12, 19. If we look back at that and the, the sermon that Shandy taught, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will pay, says the Lord. And some of us think, well, okay, so Paul is saying like, oh, don't take vengeance out, but now... These authorities are, quote, avengers who carry out God's wrath, right? And so I think sometimes there's that confusion of like, okay, what's the difference? Like, how does that correlate with what Paul just talked about beforehand? I think it's important to clarify that Paul is not referring to vengeance, but he's referring to social order, okay? Without any judicial punishment, it would be anarchy. So the government doesn't have this vendetta. They're supposed to be an institution that was ordained by God simply to punish the wrongdoer common grace, in a sense, for everyone on earth, for the preservation and protection of society so it can keep running. First Thessalonians 4.6, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger 
and all these things as we told you beforehand. So I think it's important to remember this is a general rule of thumb that we need to be subject to the authorities because God has instituted it to keep us safe. He's instituted it so that people can follow the law and that we can have social order. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't disobey governments, for instance, when they call us to disobey God's word. So point three, authorities are to be submitted to. Verses five through seven. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Therefore, in light, so Paul kind of reaffirms, one must be in subjection. We must submit to the governments. Two points why. To avoid God's wrath and also for the sake of conscience. So I think the principle that we derive from this is that God calls us to obey the governing authorities as much as we can and as long as their law and order does not contradict the word of God. Because God has instituted the authorities for the preservation and protection of society, but he also calls us to obey the governing authorities so that we can show the value and worth of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. First Peter 2, 13 through 19 says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as living servants of God, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. So live as people who are free, meaning you've been free from the law of sin and death. You've been given grace, but do not use that to warrant evil actions. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as living servants of God. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. <clears throat> the challenge that we have today is to live in submission to authorities, though, while also battling the corruption and evil that we see in it. And the big question is, how do we do this? I think of the story of Daniel and the lion's den, like the classic one, you know. Honestly, when I think of it, I think of Veggie Tales before <laughs> the actual, like, uh, scripture, which is probably not a good thing. But basically, what's interesting about Daniel's life is that he is submissive to these authorities. Now, are these authorities perfect? No, but he submits to them in every single way, right? But he's obedient to his God. He prays every night, every day. And these other authorities don't like that King Darius likes Daniel more than they do. And so they're trying to gain, they're ambitiously trying to gain more prestige in that government. So they're looking at Daniel to see if they can show something that is wrong with him. They're looking at him, analyzing him, scrutinizing him. Like if you're being watched, you know, 24-7, I mean, that's kind of intimidating. But they're looking at him to see if they can find something wrong with Daniel, and they can't find it. In fact, they can't find any, law, any, any rule or law that he's breaking, so they create a law that he can break. So they kind of, you know basically are kind of like, you know, cutting them out of the deal. So they create a law where you cannot pray to any other god or worship any other god besides King Darius. So they're kind of sucking up to the king and then making Daniel look really bad. I think that's a really good picture, perhaps, of how we should live with our lives according to the governing authorities. So how do we live in submission like Daniel did, but also battle corruption and evil? Here's a good application point. If one law is made that is contrary to God's law, do not obey it. And by all means, resist it in a manner of love. But do not disobey every law that comes from the government. Does that make sense? So, basically, do not be a spokesperson for anarchy. And I thought I was going to get through the sermon without using a movie analogy, but that didn't happen. So, has anyone of you guys ever seen The Dark Knight? Yes. Probably, I don't like Batman. I'm going to tell you guys, I don't think Batman's a real superhero. Yeah. Okay. 
But, but I would say, so I would say though that The Dark Knight is the best superhero movie, okay? We can talk about that later. But the, point, the one thing I really enjoy about The Dark Knight and something that I don't like when people say like, oh, Batman's a vigilante, I'm like, he's really not though because throughout the entire movie or trilogy, he uses the judicial law system, right, to bring criminals in. Right? Batman doesn't believe in killing, his number rules don't kill, and he doesn't use guns, right? Which I know is hard for us in the South, but, <laughs> but he doesn't use those means, right? He uses the judicial law system, the court cases, to bring those criminals to justice. So he helps the law enforcement bring them to justice by bringing them evidence, by pushing them to their limits so that they, they witness against other criminals. But then in The Dark Knight you get the Joker, right? And the Joker is, in a way, the Shakespearean you know, attempt to create ethical dilemmas that bring people down, to show them who they really are, right? I always think of the famous interrogation scene where he's like, you know, when the chips are down, right, all these civilized people, you know, they'll eat each other, right? He's trying to prove that in order to combat evil, you have to disobey the law itself, He's trying to show Batman that if you want to defeat me, you're going to have to break your two rules and rather kill me or harm other people while you do it. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the really big, I know I'm nerding out a little bit, but that's like the big issue that Batman's facing, right? Everybody's like, most superhero movies are like, oh, you got to take down the bad guy and, and kill him. But Batman's worried about true justice, right? He needs to learn how to combat this evil corruption without breaking the law, Right? And as Christians, I think we find ourselves in the same instance, right? In indecent times and places when people are trying to tear us down, right? How are we responding to the government, right? Or how are we responding to people who are, or to corruption, for instance, when those times do come, right? If the, if the government was to instate a law that against religious freedom, how do we react? What's the biblical way to react? Um, I think of like Westboro Baptist, for instance, you know, like I grew up mainly Baptist and stuff, and they are using their freedom to protest and to act unjustly against the government. I would not say that they protest and they say very mean things. Like, that's, that's not what we're called to do to respond to maybe the corruption that we see in the government, right? We don't break other laws to fix another law. That doesn't make any sense, right? Like, if Batman was to kill the Joker and, like, do what the Joker wanted, he wouldn't be any different than him, right? He would just be indecent. He would approve the Joker's point. And so I think what a lot of things we see with, like, different governments, for instance, like with Hitler, the question's like, well, if we're supposed to submit to authorities. What about, like, you know, Hitler in Germany, right? What about that? Like, how do, how do we confront that? But I think what Satan loves to do, he's very much kind of like the Joker mentality. He's an agent of chaos, right? He's against order. He wants to tear people down, so he puts those people there. He, God allows those people there, so that way Satan can be used to show that there is true good in humanity because of the Holy Spirit and because of salvation. Because when, when you have those evil people instated, their proof, this, the devil, Satan, wants to try to prove to us no one will stand for Christ. No one will stand up, not by inciting political revolution or trying to use, uh, break the law to prove their own points, right? But to show that they love God above everything else. The means do not justify the end. You should obey the laws in such a way that only one way they can prove you to be against social, civil order is if they create a law intentionally against us, just like the story of Daniel. We should seek justice in our country in such a way that shows our ultimate value and citizenship is not in this world, but in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the future to come. So when Paul talks about, like, um, if we look at 1 Peter you know, he talks about, for this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Or live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as living servants of God. You should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. So when you suffer unjustly, you are showing that you value God's opinion of you more than the government's. Suffer for good, not for evil, so that one can have good reason, to, so that no one can have good reason to reject Jesus Christ. 
do people know you for your political agenda or do they know you because you stand for Jesus Christ? In this last campaign, was I, I, I saw people that they were more outspoken about their politics and about the corruption in the government than they were about the gospel. I'm not here to talk about politics. I'm not here to tell you who to vote or who not to vote on, but I am here to say that the way you react to the government shows people whether or not you stand for Christ or you stand for political agenda. You see, because like, let, let's use the analogy here. Let's say, who can I pick on today? Uh, Royce. Okay, yeah. Yeah, he volunteered, so. So, Royce and I are brothers, okay? And let's say I have my Burger King toy with me, okay? We're younger, okay? Like, <laughs> we're, we're much younger, okay? Like five or six, whatever you want to call it. But I have my Burger King toy, okay? And I love playing with it, you know? Like, back, back when Burger King toys were good, like nowadays, it's cardboard or something. But I'm playing with my Burger King toy, and Royce comes up, and he snatches it from me. Okay, so if we, if we look at the scheme of things, Royce is wrong, right, for snatching from me. Like, he can, he can at least ask, right, but he's six years old and doesn't know any better. So he takes my Burger King toy, right? Now, I have two ways to react. The first one is that I respectfully, lovingly ask for it back, and if he doesn't, I go get my mom or dad, right? <laughs> Second way to react is I punch him in the face, and maybe I use words that I just learned, you know? And... <laughs> I pummel him, I wrestle him to the ground, and I'm just like, give me back my toy, you know? And then mom and dad walk in, right? <laughs> How well do you think it's going to go over for me to prove that he broke that law against me? Not very well. So let's put that in context with the government. The government calls us to disobey one of God's commands. The way we react will show whether or not we still respect and honor them or it'll show that we're no different than them, right? Don't give anybody any reason to think that your disobedience is for evil. Don't suffer for evil. Suffer for good, right? So if Royce took my Burger King toy and I respectfully asked for it back, you know, that's, I kind of suffered a little bit because someone treated me really badly. But I w was out of love and out of respect, knowing what God has called me to do. I'm going to respect him as much as I can, but I'm going to work at trying to right that wrong, right? And it's the same thing with the government. If the government punishes you, let it be because they are contradicting God's word and law. Let them see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Suffering for good showcases the love we have and the value we put in the life to come. You see, when people try to push for their political agenda to the point of, of contradicting God's word or trying to control things because they don't trust in God's sovereignty in this world and they, they're afraid of all the things that are happening and going on in this world with the campaign, the campaigns that come, or, you know, taxes increasing, whatever happens, when I see that, I don't see Christ. I see someone trying to perfect their little world to make it work. Does that highlight Christ? Or are you so caught up in your own political agenda. You shouldn't have that as your banner, right? Because that proves to people that you put more stake in this world than you do in the next. And when you suffer for wrong in a submissive way, because some of us are like, well, you know, I'll just, <clears throat> you know, if the, if the government was to do this or, someone or some type of authority was to do this, I would totally just, like, ream them, you know? Like, I'll be up there with Texas or something and just, you know, doing whatever, that shows that you're more worried about what happens in this life than in the next. Do not let the authorities, do not let the world confuse your allegiance to some political agenda, but rather make it clear in your life that your allegiance is strictly to Jesus Christ and in the internal life to come. So I used to live in, um, in near, no, I didn't live, I lived near Washington, D.C., about 45 minutes away. And one of the really cute museums in D.C. is the Holocaust Museum. So uh, I was really young. I was like 10, 11 or something. I go to the Holocaust Museum with my parents, and um, there is a Holocaust survivor there, and she had been in the concentration camps. And it was interesting to hear her story because she, I mean, she couldn't talk a lot about it because I was so young, you know, and, and my mom wanted to be sure that, you know, we were kept safe from, from what she could really explain. 
But what was interesting is she didn't have any bitterness towards those people that did that to her. Or I think of Corey Ten Boom, who was um, abused and tortured in the concentration camp and forgave the man that wasn't part of that who came to her church, and she had no bitterness. There is something to be said about the Christians throughout history who have been under governing authorities that are um, tyrannical or dangerous. Honestly, guys, we were born in a, in a very privileged country. This is a, 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 we have a fantastic government in many instances. You know, there may be corruption, there may be things wrong with it, but I don't think we have really the right or ability to say how one should react in such situations. I think we could look to our brothers and sisters who have endured it, who are enduring it. Um, me, Ben, and Nathaniel were driving, and um, his cousin Ben talked about um, this video that he watched about Coptic, Christ- Coptic Christians getting um, beheaded by some terrorists overseas. And they submissively went to their deaths. And they, they weren't fighting, they weren't trying to um, get free. They simply allow themselves to be sacrificed in that instance. And, you know, I know there's a lot of different discussion about what would you do in that kind of situation, you know, or, or whatever, but there is something to be said about the way they went to their deaths. It's unashamedly true to me to see that what their value is in. Like, how can someone be so loving to their captors and to those tyrants, you know? How can they be so loving to them and then allow them to, to die like that, you know? It begs the question, what is their value in? They're suffering for good because they're showing, they're highlighting the darkness that really is present, right? So like with Royce, if he stole my Burger King toy and I didn't say anything and I respected him, who do you think's going to look like the wrongdoer? Royce will, right? But if I beat him and I get all mad with him and stuff, nobody can tell the difference, Right? Kind of like the Joker, right? Royce is kind of like the Joker's the younger brother trying to steal things from me and trying to see if he can get a rise out of me, right? So that I'm no better than him. But when I don't, it begs the question, well, how, how does someone react like that? Because the natural part of human nature is to react, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? So the principle that comes down to it is that when it's, you submit to authorities with resistance against evil and against corruption, This highlights the darkness and reveals the grace and goodness in you made possible by the Holy Spirit. So I know we're kind of talking a much broader scope when it comes to how we react and how we live in this country, how we react to authorities, the law enforcement, to different people, even coming down to like, do you drive five or ten over to the speed limit, you know? Like, maybe that's something to think about. I I drive five over, and maybe I shouldn't do that, but... (laughs) I like, getting places, I like getting places faster, so, you know. But, but there is something to be said about how do we respect the authorities. And when it comes to the darkness we see in this world or the evil and corruption, how are you going to react to it? Submission doesn't always necessarily mean obedience to every single thing the person does. You know, like the Bible calls wives to submit their husbands, but that doesn't mean that oh, submissive wife just obeys everything her husband says, right? Because what if it's evil, right? So... Submission is more about love and about putting your value where it stands when it comes to the church, when it comes to family, when it comes to the government. Are you highlighting God's grace? Or do people, do people see a political agenda when they see you, or do they see the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you? Because if you suffer for good, that is much better than suffering for evil. And people can know, it can beg the question that they ask the reason of the hope in you to know why, why are they so loving? Why do they not put so much stake in this world? And they can be like, well, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he crucified and that he died and that he resurrected for me. So I want you guys to think about that, take time, and uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, I want to thank you for your word. And um, even though there are a lot of difficult passages that we sometimes do not exactly understand, Lord, how it fits into the larger context, that we remember that the most important thing is that we display as best as we possible, possibly can the gospel of Jesus Christ, the value and worth of your son for what he's done for us and the way we live, Lord, that even in the broader scope of uh, how we react to law enforcement or authorities, Lord, that we would be respectful, that we would honor them, Lord, in such a way that even if there is evil or corruption, Lord, that we can work 
as Christians, that we can show um, what good and evil is, Lord, according to your word, and that people can see the grace of Jesus Christ in our hearts. I just ask for this. I also lift up our brothers and sisters, Lord, across the world who are also suffering under um, oppression, Lord, perhaps by authorities, but yet they are also submissive because they have their worth and value in you. I pray that you would help us to learn uh, from them and that we can grow closer to you each and every day. And I pray this in your precious son's name. Jesus Christ, amen.